time. So, I is, the, okay. So, this portion of the um, program today is me and Lindsay Ekstrom. So, Lindsay is here. Lindsay is an educator who is also a member of her school board, West Hope School Board. So she works for CREA, Central Region Education Associate Agency, and she is a school board, and she's also a member of the State Board of Public School Education, which by default includes her as the CTE board. So she has a lot of board experience as well as being an educator. She's gonna help me today explain from a board's perspective our next portion. The B, North Dakota B Legendary School Board Leadership Institute. So you jump in anytime, <laughs> all right? So you heard me say this this morning, probably a couple times. Student outcomes don't change, I will say, will never change until adult behaviors change. And that actually begins with you. The choices you make, the decisions you make, the questions you ask. There's a lot of a lot of opportunity, let's just say, to point fingers if only those teachers would, if only that superintendent would, if only these families would. But none of that is actually within the control. The change of adult behaviors begins with the only people that we can control. And I would imagine any of you that have had young people in your life, have raised children or been with grandchildren or nieces or nephews, have probably shared that advice to young people. The only thing you can control is how you respond to it. I know Susie wasn't very nice to you, but the only thing that you can control is how you <coughs> react. And the same adage is true with this. So we talked about this a little bit this morning as well. Why do school systems exist? The United States was the very first country in the world to have free public education for all. It was a great experiment. And it wasn't to create doctors and scientists and great inventors, which is a great byproduct of public education, but it was actually to create an educated citizenry that was able to govern themselves. And so I understand, you know, I come from a small town. I understand that there's a lot of pressure on you as school board members to be the employer, to be the economic development center of your community. And those are important. It's important to have, you know, a, a principal and, and, and have a, you know, the, the principal spouse brings another economy, another employable person into your community. But really, we have a whole other different state agency and a whole other funding stream of money that goes to job service and economic development in the state of North Dakota. The reason public schools exist is to ensure that each student every year continuously improves in what they know and are able to do so that they are prepared to be successful in whatever they choose to do after their K-12 journey. That is the reason schools exist. That is the reason that you've been elected as, as school board members. We created North Dakota B Legendary School Board Institute to assist our school board members in helping them receive the professional development that they deserve in order to be the most effective portion of the K-12 leadership in each and every one of the communities. What we recognized is 98%, so every two years, every biennium, the state legislature invests 2.5 billion dollars this session. 2.5 billion dollars of your neighbors, friends, and families taxpayer money into our K-12 schools. 
98% of that funds, 98% of that $2.5 billion budget that gets approved as the DPI budget, 98% of 2.5 gets delivered out to all of you to make decisions on how to spend. 2% stays at the state level to run operations. The COVID funding that Rebecca just spoke about, we received half a billion dollars in North Dakota. 90% of that delivered out to you all to decide and approve. Your votes decided how that was going to be spent. What we recognized at the Department of Public Instruction is that we, prevent, we provide a ton of opportunity for our employees, for staff members to receive professional development. Right now across the state, we're providing bus drivers with professional development. Uh, child nutrition staff all across the state, Linda who you met at lunch, they're doing training all across the state. We provide training for crossing guards, for teacher's aides, for paraprofessionals, for teachers, for activities directors, for principals, superintendents, and yet we've never invested the opportunity for school board members to have their own professional development and they make decisions for 98% of $2.5 billion. So we created the North Dakota Be Legendary Institute modeled after a program that began in Kansas City, Missouri and then was taken to Texas and created statewide. And it's an opportunity for our school boards to work with their district leadership to create programs and have meetings that are focused on what our purpose is, student outcomes. So this Be Legendary Leadership Institute framework is based on six critical pillars. First, you adopt student outcome goals, looking at data. Then you adopt goal progress measures. How are you gonna measure whether your school district is making progress to or achieving those goals? Monitoring the student outcome goals, structuring for success, adopting guardrails for yourself and for your leadership team that you hire, and then active teamwork and advocacy for public education. So, um, this is a, an example of how a board engaged in the North Dakota Bee Legendary would rate themselves. How has the board adopted student outcome goals? This two-day institute that comes to your community, trains your board, helps you understand the difference between inputs. Is it important to have high quality teachers that have a good negotiated benefit and salary package? Absolutely it is. But that shouldn't be your goal as a board to count yourself successful. That's an input. That's what is necessary to be in place in order to reach your goal. So the training helps you understand the difference between inputs, outputs, outcomes, and more specifically, student outcomes. Is an outcome a balanced budget? Yes. But is it the purpose of a school system to have a balanced budget? It's an important goal to have a balanced budget but it's not a student outcome goal. So this is just a rubric, an example of that. There's a manual. The intention of the Two Day Institute is to create a supportive space in which governing teams can learn about and prepare for intense focus on improving student outcomes. Participants, participants in the Institute will embrace the following skills, knowledge and mindset and of the most important of this is mindset yes you need skills you need to understand how to work as a board you need to understand how to help support your superintendent and district leadership team you need to have knowledge about 
academic scores, where are you at, but most importantly, the mindset of the absolute intensely powerful impact that you have on student outcomes. This two-day training takes you through these nine steps, beginning with, I am the genesis of transformation. The change for why student outcomes in our school district begins with me. Not those families that can't take care of anything, not those teachers that you know didn't work as hard as I did when I was a teacher, not any of those things. It all begins with I. The training also helps you look at your own data on ND Insights and says, where were we at for all students? Where were we at for our Hispanic or Native American students, our English learners? Where do we want to be? Can I just click? No. Or not. Nope. I will, is this connected to the internet? It is. to be here. Congratulations on your election or your re-election. I myself was just re-elected here this, this June and, and uh, seated in July. And our school board just completed the training in April, um, two days, and it was the most empowering and energizing experience of my tenure, my six-year tenure to date. Um, we routinely access school boards association um, conferences and support. Um, on speed dial, we've got Alexis on speed dial and her team, um, and it's a really great complement to um, all that we have learned there. What I know and what I learned, what I left with, or, or one thing that I left with, I'll share more in a little bit, is that we really, we maybe looked at some of our student outcome data, but not to the degree that I think all of us seated around the table wanted to um, or want to and continue to uh, aspire to do just that. Special codes and all we have. Yeah. Yeah. The firewalls at the state it, are real, let yeah. me tell you, keeping us. Are we close? Uh-huh. Okay. If I can type. Thank you for that, Lindsay. Oh, not there. Okay. There we go. should be the focus of every adult in the school system from the school board president all the way down to the principal and parents and teachers. It might look a little different for every student, but that should be our primary focus. The training program, Be Legendary School Board Training, really is a mind shift for boards and superintendents. Boards aren't experts on education, but they are elected representatives and the public tasks them with facilitating the strategic plan and implementing what needs to happen in the school district and the main thing is, are our students getting the outcomes academically that they deserve? And so helping our school board leaders understand how to set those student outcome goals 
And then when we're asked what difference did that money make, we're going to be able to have hard, solid data because our student outcomes went from here to here. 90% of board members' time is spent on adult behaviors, such as building the budget, facilities, and grounds, and maintenance, and operations. And normally less than 10% is actually spent talking about student outcomes. I truly believe student outcome-focused governance is the hope for our nation because almost every state in which we go, our third grade reading scores are simply not where they need to be. One of our main beliefs is that the better your board is and the more training your board does, the better off your district and your students will be. So this training was just awesome because number one, it really puts the focus back on student outcomes. Each district in North Dakota had the opportunity to choose from several possible goals, and so you kind of customize them to what you think your district needs. So for us, focusing on the performance for third grade reading was focusing on eighth grade math, and then focusing on to make sure our students at the high school were choice ready. This training provided the education and the resources that we as policymakers, decision makers, need to make better decisions so that our students can continue to succeed. There are a lot of things that capture the attention of boards. Most of them, unfortunately, aren't actually going to drive the forward to improvement. The nature of this work is to give boards the tools they need to actually be focused on the things that matter, to be intensely focused on improving student outcomes. To change behaviors with our students, I strongly believe that it has to come from the top. Our common goal has to come back to the students and what we expect them to become in the future. We invest professional development in our teachers, our superintendents, and our building leaders. It's now time for us to expect that our school boards have the same type of training. All of my work in public education has made it clear to me that student outcomes don't change until adult behaviors change. So that's just um, a little bit, um, a, a video, hearing it from the superintendents, from school board members themselves. Um, Lindsay's been a board member now for six, six years. Yeah. I was a board member for nine years. Donna, you were for nine or 12? Nine. nine years. Um, lots of regional, con you know, lots of state co conferences, lots of regional, lots of national. And there's lots of school board governance out there that is good. Um, coherent governance is one model. Um, there's lots of strategic planning that is offered out there. All very good. But what I'm hearing, and what struck me, and what I'm hearing continuously from people um, that have done this training and are experiencing the training now is that they fail to take that last step. Even coherent governance or the strategic planning that might be offered fails to take that toughest but necessary step to saying, Governance on student outcomes, student outcome-based governance. And we'll hear from board members both in the states and in this nation, it's like, it's okay, we don't need that, our board gets along. We're not like those Virginia boards that fight or are in the media all the time. And my favorite response to that is one that I learned from A.J. Craybill who helped us and he started this. He, it, he was a school board president in Kansas City, Missouri, out, about to be taken over by the state of Missouri's education department. And he said, give us one more chance to turn it around ourselves. So the commissioner of education in Missouri said, okay, you've got one more chance. And he and his board built this from the ground up. And they stayed out of receivership is what it's called. They stayed, the state didn't take control. They turned their student outcomes around. And he said, yes, you can be a professionally ineffective board. And then other board members will say, you know what? We actually are in and out in 25 minutes. And AJ will say, that's true. You can be an efficient, ineffective board. <laughs> in fact, you can be a professionally efficient, ineffective board. Because you're not really an effective board unless you are moving your students towards better student outcomes. Because that should be the measure of effectiveness of your entire system, top to bottom. And so we really do believe in this. I'm going to shut this down and pull the PowerPoint back up. Um, 
Yes. So we invested our COVID funding. The, I said that 90% was delivered out to our school districts. 10% was reserved at the state to do statewide initiatives that the entire state could take advantage of. Um, I think I need to do, I don't know. We're just going to leave it. Um, we used COVID funding to begin this program to build the manuals, to train coaches, to offer grants to our school districts. But the legislature saw the effectiveness of this, heard from their own school board members and their own legislative districts, and said, we want all of our school boards to be trained in this, if possible. We partnered with our North Dakota School Boards Association, again, because this is their lane. Department of Public Instruction doesn't do boards. We just partner with the people that do. So they said, we want to do this. And so they provided enough funding to train all 168 boards in the state if the demand, and hoping that the demand is there. So what this covers, and I'll get to this a little bit, but the competitive grant cycle is open, and we will be accepting applications for your board to go through this if your district would be so inclined. As I said, the training does take time. It's two days, but the trainers, come out to you, to be in your community, to get to know you. There's enough demand on your time as you know, quasi-volunteer board members and enough demand on your, your superintendent and le district leadership team. But if you want to, the application is on that website. We'll share is this with you again at the end. Two days in a row? What's that? Is it two days right Two in days a in a row. Yep. During the week? Whenever you want, they do Saturdays and Sundays, they do Fridays and Saturdays, they do whatever, whatever meets the board's needs. So, we as a state are covering 50% of the cost. They do encourage boards to work together because you actually just like today, you're learning from each other, you're sharing ideas, you're brainstorming things. Um, so, if one board wants to do it separately, schedules are tough. Um, the board, DPA, DPI pays 50%, so the cost of the school board is $4,350. Two boards going together, $3,100. No more than three boards should go together for uh, effectiveness, and that's $2,500. This might be a really dumb question, but can you use your ESSER funds for it? You sure can. Yep. That's a great question. That's a really great question. Yes, COVID ESSER funds can be used. Title II funds for professional development can be used. Title I. In addition to your board members, um, obviously we'd like your superintendent and any of your superintendent's leadership team, business managers have sat in, and they would be participants. But you can have an unlimited number of people um, if you have a teacher leader or if you have a vice principal. They might not be a participant in the training, but they can certainly come and make sure that they are um, engaging or witnessing what your board and leadership is engaging in. Today, just by word of mouth, 20% of our school board members <coughs> representing 20% of our North Dakota students, just coincidentally. And I think we're closer to 25% right now. So after only a year and a half of implementation, nearly 25% of our school boards have said, this is what we want to do. School board members receive individual certificates of completion and a letter of gratitude from the state superintendent. Certified board members are recognized at the governor's annual education innovation summit each summer. I think we have nine boards, uh, somewhere I'm, I'm guessing, but next week at the governor's summit, nine boards will be showing up and being recognized on stage by the governor for engaging in this work. Boards. What's that? 23 boards. 23 boards are going to be recognized at the governor's summit. Wow. Okay. 57% of the trained boards have opted in for ongoing coaching. So the two-day institute gets your mindset. It gets you started on the journey. But just like any of you have tried to build muscle mass or lose weight, 
you bought that Pelotron, you you know got bought that recipe book or engaged in that membership at your gym, it's the behavior change that needs ongoing coaching for a year. The measurement of whether you're making progress or not is your actual agenda. What percentage of your time at your board meetings is discuss are discussing the progress of your student outcomes and not which contract should, who should get the contract for school bus tires. So this is kind of our progress. This is a, a, a survey that every board member gets after the two-day training. Just some things to point out. Um, <coughs> I would recommend this institute to other school boards and leadership teams, 95%. Rarely do we get that. Some testimonials from Carrington. I learned the importance of a strong superintendent board relationship and having a shared vision. The training helped me understand the proper changes. With proper changes, we can really can make an impact. Help me understand with the proper change. Oh, there it is. To change behaviors with our students, I strongly believe it has to come from the top. The most important thing I learned from the training was how to reflect and evaluate ourselves before others. And now, Lindsay yes. uses the questions. What else did you have to add before I actually ask? Yeah, you? there was a couple of things that popped into my mind. Um, first, we, being a small school, so enrollment has oscillated anywhere between 140 and 160 in West Oak over my six year tenure. So, just to give you an idea, kind of of our size. And that means that we have a, a business manager, a superintendent, and a principal. So, that's really what our, our leadership, um, in a formal sense, looks like within our school. And so what we did, or the approach we took, was our board, our business manager, and our superintendent went through the two-day institute together, and our principal, and interestingly, <coughs> our activities director, um, went to a neighboring training at a different time so that both of our administrators or all of our leaders weren't out of the building at the same time. So that was one strategy that we used, but we wanted to make sure that those that are making decisions uh, are all have real similar context. So I think that helped a lot to make sure that we're all on a level playing field in terms of the mindset piece that Superintendent Basler has referred to. Uh, I did find great power in being with other boards during the training. I think it was really helpful to know that the struggles in Turtle Lake or Glen Ullen were similar to those in West Oak, while very geographically diverse. We have, com we have common struggles and problems, and that's, that's helpful to be able to network as such. Good. Yeah. So the question. Yes. The three components that impact adult behavior, knowledge, skills, and mindset. Why, in your opinion, is mindset so important? Yes. Mindset is so incredibly important because being a board member comes with difficulties. Um, particularly, it's quite distracting, or it can be very distracting. Um, as has been referenced a few times, uh, you know, the boiler, the where the marquee should go, um, snow removal procedures, believe it or not, as I think about my uh, six years and tenure, those are things that have been distracting, let alone really legitimate patron, patron concerns, staffing issues, um, football, basketball, uniform, color, right? All of these things get to be really distracting. And so the mindset piece, is really critical because it serves as like a catalyst to even get to the skills or the knowledge piece. Um, I think a lot about education as being a gift and I think that we as board members sort of in concert with our administrators have the opportunity to create the package. So the gift that we give to all kids. So without that mindset it's really hard to do that in a common Way. That's a great answer. So you mentioned uniform colors, where to put the marquee, yeah. how snow removal procedures should go. Somebody called and you know probably talked to you and said the snow remo removal should probably be done differently. Um, yes. <laughs> and that's how it rose to the board level. So since the training, what has changed, or what is your view of the board versus the superintendent? Yeah. 
I appreciate that question. I also appreciate the opportunity just to clarify. We just completed our training in April, so that wasn't that long ago, right? So as we move into this, this shift with a, with a new mindset shift, um, it, that has brought about role and responsibility delineation and, and necessary communication to delineate roles and responsibilities. Um, what I will say <clears throat> is two things. Um, first of all, one of my peers, so fellow board member, insurance agent by trade, not an educator, um, just relating back to that mindset piece, we meet in the mornings. And so oftentimes, our, our students are entering the building or there's some commotion in the hallway and it's just, it, it's an exciting place to be, right, right with students. Well, she had excused herself to the bathroom and, and came back into one of our board meetings and while she, whether she was supposed to be behaving this way or not, she whispered to me, I look at the students differently, Lindsay. Yes, we do because we're talking about them, right? That mindset is present, that student outcomes are the most important thing. Well, what that's done is it's changed or shifted our agendas so that we focus on student outcomes, so that that's what we really talk about. And I'll say, in the first few months, we have become a more efficient board per the timekeeping. <laughs> I think we're still working on effectiveness, but, but finding some sort of balance in there. Our, our annual meeting was markedly shorter than the previous year's meetings, and that's because we don't do less or know less, but when we do, the work and when we put in our time is different. We don't have marathon meetings anymore. We really do our homework and our research outside of the boardroom because we're provided with information in order to make good decisions and don't need all that discussion on snow removal, the marquee, the uniforms. We talk about student outcomes and that's allowed us to grow an understanding of what student outcomes mean. So, you can tell me if you agree or disagree, or if you have had similar experiences. Um, so, one thing, um, a superintendent shared with me their experience, North Dakota, shared with me their experience that one of their board members, it was a multi-building district, um, but one of their board members, who was you know, super engaged, longtime board member, uh, had driven up to the school and was not very happy with the, the condition of the grounds, of the grass and the, the grounds around the um, school building. And stopped in, you know, it was the board president nonetheless. And so stopped in, had an open door relationship with the superintendent, and so went in and expressed his concern and um, dissatisfaction with the way that the grounds around the building were. And so the superintendent duly noted, you know, affirmed with the superintendent that he would, you know, or with the school board president that, yep, he would, he would address that. So that superintendent called all of his building principals together and the custodians at those buildings and talked to them about the way that the grass looked. And it, communicated to the superintendent, imagine how powerful that influence is if that same school board member would have come in and said, hey, you know what? I noticed that our third grade reading scores or our eighth grade math scores aren't the way that they need to be. And school board or school X down the road is doing something, we should take a look at it. If one comment from one board member cause that superintendent to stop what he was doing, bring all of his district level and building level people together to talk about an issue, but it had nothing to do with student outcomes. So what the same board or the same superintendent shared was he felt like he was serving two masters and he was like a, almost a 20 year superintendent. He felt like he was being ripped in two different directions because he had the master of the parents and the state and the feds saying we need our kids reading and writing and doing math. But then he had a whole other set of masters over here, of board members that wanted nice grounds, that wanted X, Y, and Z, that wanted the marquee to be here and the marquee to be there. And he said, if I would have known it would have made this much difference in my own personal, my professional career, 
He said, we're all going on the same direction now. Our student outcome goals are our board's goals. He said he felt like you know, he'd leave a board meeting and try to have conversations about how their students were doing. He was on a bus to Chicago and he realized that after the meeting that his board members had just taken a plane to Vegas and they were going in two different directions and he said for the first time in his life he felt like instead of managing or having to deal with the board, they were all, they were helping, they were in it together to focus on student outcomes. I think we've had a real similar experience uh, to follow our training and our establishing of goals and there was a bit of time between solidifying or approving our our goals and, and completing the training. Uh, our administrative teams have been faced with difficult decisions, right, as we begin to open or begin a new school year. Uh, much like many of yours, I'm certain have been faced with as well. And the, the focus of the four goals that we have is allowed for focus and clarity and confident decision making. I think about it as a Venn diagram. I think about accountability as being one side of the diagram, and I think about support being the other, and right in the middle is expectations. So we as a board have outlined our expectations in terms of student outcomes for the next five years, which holds our superintendent accountable, which holds, it happens to be a him in this instance, his leadership team or his administrative team accountable, who will hold our classroom teachers accountable, and that's met with support as well. Um, so it, it's embracing the mindset, it's embracing the knowledge and the skills component of the training, it's really embodying the goals, and then uh, really thinking about what do you need in order to be successful to meet these expectations, running right down the middle of that diagram. That's a great example. That is. Very visual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? So you say that's a price per board. Yeah. So let's say next year we get new elections. What's mm -hmm. your way to get training up to them? So that's, very, that's a very good question. So we actually just had a brainstorming. So we're building this as we're flying it, and um, we're one of the first states in, in the nation other than Texas did it as kind of a punitive thing. Um, but that's the conversation. We believe that similar, let, let's see, so um, Ellendale is in here. Ellendale, obviously. Um, so she went through, you can ask her, and how it was, but obviously they'll have new board members. And so we'll probably have convenings Similar to this, so if Ellendale gets a new board member, um, you get a new two new board members, they can come together and learn from each other so they are on the same page and understanding that same philosophy um, and we will continue to support that financially as well. So. so you're talking boards coming together or the new members coming together? The new members, okay. the new members. But do you guys feel the training is more beneficial because you're all going to training as a board and growing as a team or is it going to still get that same gear mesh with one going to a training one year after another or you know I, I see there's yeah. I'm not saying the training's bad but right. I'm saying as us as a board would all go as one team I think it would be very beneficial but if say XY gets voted in mm -hmm. they might get a different perspective of the training as so, it could be good, yes. Yeah. But I'm so I think, and again, um, what um, what others what Texas had done is they started actually a board member school board school, and it's for actually candidates okay. that. So the initial tra the initial training, absolutely, your board is going to have to go through it as that transformational moment, that convening yep. moment. And then it's actually that year of coaching where you keep reminding each other and holding each other accountable. And then after that, just like going to the gym or changing your eating habits, the culture of your board Will change. changes. Yeah. And so that one or two off that get elected or you know two retired and two new come on, they'll get the basic training, but they'll be enveloped by your culture that well, is now. something that a guy can do maybe every two or three years yeah. to Refresher. Refresher for everybody. Very, I'm looking at Alexis as we're, and Donna as we're building it. So those are the two co-conspirators back there is Donna and Alexis. So that's actually or a really good point. 101 or 102 classes or. Yep. Yeah. But I think it is, it's a really healthy practice. Yeah. When I just think about you know our small local community, uh, I think it, it, what we've done is set an expectation mm -hmm. to be a part of our board. 
honestly. Yep. And so I, I think that's really healthy in terms of this is what our board focuses on. We keep the main thing the main thing here in West Oak. And so I think that we have the opportunity to norm that, uh, that student outcomes per, that are predictive of our learners' success, we owe it to our, to our learners. And so we have the opportunity to create that right in our own, right around our own table. Do you have, I'd like, I'd like I was gonna say, um, Ellen Dill, we did, we finished our training a year ago, so we're, we're a year ahead of you. Yeah. I'll yeah. let you know, yeah. it gets better. Yeah, all right, because uh, it, it can be messy in the beginning. Right, well, and it just, it's, again, it's a complete switch in how, how you think about your duty as a board member. But it's an amazing switch. Um, Which is in such a way that it actually, like, saves you so much time because you are not getting lost in the weeds on things that really are not discussions we should have ever been having at the board table. Um, but you get wrapped up in that because that's where you're like, okay, we're going to spend money on this. We better talk about it. But those questions should have been asked before it ever came to the board to decide. So it makes you think about what you're doing and really streamlines so that you're effective in what you're doing. That sounds like a good point. And the best part about it, like yeah. three of our board members were able to attend. The whole board was not able to be there. But we were able to bring everybody with us because the three of us that attended saw so much value in it that we were able to the other board like members. just let them know how we're gonna do this. And to, to give you an example of the difference that it made, uh, this spring when the testing was completed and the teachers were able to see where their test scores were, the EL, our ELA teacher came in to interrupt one of our committee meetings because she was celebrating that her students had scored like above what they had projected. And so she wanted to know, let us know as board members, hey, what we're doing is making a difference. And that's the first time a teacher has ever gone out of the way to talk to us as a board about test scores without asking. And why is that? Why should teachers feel free to come to the board and celebrate those things instead of waiting for it to be a problem? You're so, in it together. Yeah. Yep. You're in it together. And it wasn't, this is like our third grade scores are here. This is what we want you to do. It was our third grade scores are here. What do you need from us to get them yeah. here? Yeah. So it's a complete different way. Of, it's not accusing them of not doing their job. It's what have we failed to do so that you can do your job. Because the genesis started with you. Which is why she knew that it was 39% because they've been <laughs> looking at the data. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that. There's another round of grant applications that your school mm -hmm. districts can apply for. Um, Please make the investment or consider making the investment in yourselves because you are the part. You are at the pinnacle of the decision making education tree. So, student outcomes don't change, will never change until adult behaviors change. Joe Koloski is managing all of our district coordination work. Uh, if you have any questions, just reach out to him. But of course, you know Lindsay, you know me, you know Alexis, you know Donna. Just uh, if there's nothing else to take away from today, just know that we are here to serve you. The reason we pull into our parking spots out there is to serve you so you can serve our students. I yeah. Just a quick question, and I, I think it might, maybe I missed the answer, but um, the role of the superintendent, like, did you feel that being part of the Be Legendary kind of, I don't know how that, like, did it, help the superintendent alleviate you know what he's supposed to or she is supposed to be focusing on um and maybe it, <coughs> the communication has that helped yes i think it created clarity <coughs> in the role of the superintendent and gave him in this instance permission okay. to do the things that we've now asked him to do without having to say, oh, is this side of the board table going to be excited about that, this yep. side not so excited about that? No, it's clear. It's, it's, it's clear what, what he is to okay. do. Yes. Okay. Yes. You know what you just said brings up an interesting point. I went to graduate school several decades ago, and there were four areas that we focused on as far as board training in that graduate program. That was policy, budget, legislative and of course quasi-judicial. Um, 
is this aligning, and this is for Superintendent Basler, is there any alignment with the North Dakota Council of Educational Leaders or the state graduate programs that are looking at putting more emphasis into uh, superintendent board relations? Or is that something we're just gonna do outside the classroom? So I do know that the School Board Association, you know, co-presents with NDCEL. I think I'll, at least every um, agenda that I've seen, they do a session on board superintendent relationships. I'm just not talking about just a session there, but what's higher ed doing as far as changing their preparation programs for administrators? So um, as far as the higher education preparation programs, again, that's the ESPB, but since DPI has taken the lead on the apprenticeship programs, um, we're leaning a little bit more into that. Obviously, our work began with preparation program for teachers because of the science of reading. So now we have a, a weekly meeting with EPPs. So we haven't worked on the superintendent, but now that North Dakota became the first state to add principals to the apprenticeship list, we are conversing with higher ed. But again, um, I think the demand is gonna have to come from the field. The demand for higher ed you know, higher ed is, a, is in the marketplace. So. Now, Alexis, I think this is where you and I close out. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you.